That's the first time I've ever heard him. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. It is such a joy to be in the house of the Lord this, this wonderful Easter morning to see all your smiling faces. And some of you actually are smiling, so I'm not even lying this time. It's great to be here for Easter. Yes, well, well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Try not to distract the kid from the service, okay? Uh, he's here to worship. Uh, I'm glad to have him. Let us turn to our call to worship this morning. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, very good, very good. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious Father, you sent your son to die and rise to new life in order that death might be brought to an end and that we might live a new life in him. Yet we confess that we too often have chosen to remain captive to doubt and fear in ways that lead to death. By our thoughts, by our words, by our actions, we have scorned your love, we have diminished the lives of others, and we have defaced your image in us. Father, forgive us for Jesus' sake and enable us by his resurrection power to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. So nothing happening uh, extra this week. The next week, uh, Wednesday, April 10th, 10 a.m., church council. Get it on your calendars. And also the next week, Thursday, April 11th, Bible study, 10 a.m. Uh, that's just what, what's coming up here. Any other announcements from the congregation today? Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we are so joyful today as we come. This, this Sunday of all Sundays, we remember the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, from the grave, that, that event that just turned all history upside down, gave us eternal hope, gave us reason to be joyful, uh, gave just anyone who follows after Jesus uh, the right to be called sons of God. Uh, Jesus rising from the dead just proves it and gives that to us. And so we are thankful. We, we are thankful that 2,000 years later, we, we can still recall this and we can remember and we can have our celebration here today, even as, as people of faith all over the world celebrate and remember God. And we can do it in peace. And we can uh, do it uh, without fear of reprisal from others. And we can just come and glorify your name for what you have done, particularly on that day in history. God, let us never forget it. Even as you know the weeks go by and we come to ordinary Sunday mornings, let there never be an ordinary Sunday morning. But let Sunday be the day we look to the resurrection. But this among all of them, Father, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you because, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that we will live. We do have forgiveness of sins. We have that gift of eternal life that he proved that first Easter Sunday morning. Let us never forget God, but let it go with us today and all days as we go throughout our lives, as, as we encounter the world and all the trials and circumstances and disappointments this world throws at us. God, just help us to be the, the, those people who, say, who know we are a resurrected people. We, we have Jesus Christ. We have eternal life. And let that be what guides us. Let that be what bolsters us, what gives us hope as we go through this world. Let us be joyful, Father, and, and go out and joyfully declare to others this great news. Let us uh, be overwhelmed by love because of this great news that we must go out and love others. Show us how to do that, God. Open our eyes and make us bold. Make us uh, uh, full of life to do that, God. Help us to leave behind our laziness or our pride to just serve others so that they might see your love in action. They might hear the words of your good news through us and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, they too would believe unto eternal life. God, let that be what we're about. So often people will come against us. They will argue ab about faith or against faith. And we just want to win, God. Help us to put that aside. Let it be, not be about winning or, or proving something to somebody else. But help us to be just people who are made in your image as we interact with others who are made in your image. To the glory of your name. God, we do uh, have uh, quite an extensive prayer list today. People we've been praying for, some of them are new to the list, but, but we know the, the, some of these people are mourning, some of them are grieving, some of them, most of them need healing in some way, God, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. 
uh, we ask that you provide that, that it comes from you and in you, God, and that you walk through whatever they are going through. God, they know you are with them and that you are carrying them through it as they face it. But God, give the doctors wisdom to be your agents of healings. The other medical professionals, we thank you for them. Uh, let them be your agents. God, give them wisdom and insight and perseverance and compassion. God, won't you bring comfort to those who are grieving and mourning? We pray for uh, Lynn's mom and for Kay Bigley and, and Christy and Pam and Lil and Aline and, and Dixie and, and Marty and uh, this young, young boy who Todd knows and Georgia and Mason. And, and God, uh, in a special way, we remember the, the families and friends of those lost in, in the bridge collapse in Baltimore. Uh, God, uh, we, we pray for your church in this world, starting with East Brady Baptist Church and the congregations in town here and the surrounding communities, people we know and love and just share faith with, and, uh, to the rest of the United States, to, to the whole world, God. We, we pray that you draw us to repentance first. You draw us to your word, and that we would live according to it and not according to what you know some other people might, might try to hijack our faith to say. But let us look to your word and live for you according to what you say, God, and, and bring us to that repentance. And then, and then bring through us revival, that, that the land would know your name, and that it would be lifted up and praised throughout, throughout this land and throughout the world, Father. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are serving you in places where it's dangerous for them and for their families. We pray that you protect them, you watch out for them, you keep them safe, you help them to overcome and persevere, Father, in their faith and just in their physical living as they face persecutions. God, we pray for the persecutors, that they would see the faith of those they are persecuting, and that would, by your Holy Spirit, convict them, and they too would turn to you in faith and change their life and live for you. God, we pray for all the places where there's violence, and wickedness and evil and war in this world. We pray that you change the hearts of the perpetrators, change the hearts of those who are in a place to make a difference in these things. Let them instead seek your righteousness because we know only through your righteousness will peace be experienced on this earth. We pray that you bring it, Father. We pray that you bless us in this time. Make it a joyful time for us here and make us joyful as we go from here. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why Easter matters? I mean, in our society, particularly of the, uh, among those who have grown up around or in the church or have been a part of it most of our lives, we just grow up being told Easter is important. We grow up being shown Easter is important. It's why uh, Easter Sunday morning is always one of the, the biggest uh, services of the church each year. We decorate the place extra nice. Here it is. Uh, thanks to the ladies who came to help. And we have fresh flowers. Not something we have every week, but we go through that expense. And maybe many people get a new shirt. I know I did. Or, or a new dress or an outfit or, or a pair of pantyhose. I don't know. You know, we got multiple men wearing suits here today, all for the occasion. 
in the greater culture, kids have always gotten an extra couple days off school to celebrate Easter. And we mark the day by giving baskets filled with candy or other gifts, or, or maybe you have a special family gathering, or maybe you have a special dinner with things served mostly at Easter. I pickled beets and eggs this week. How often, other than at Easter, do you pickle beets and eggs? Maybe there's a weird person out there who does it often, but we just do that on Easter, right? Or how about, you know, we'll have at our house today, we're going to have ham. And throughout the year, you'll think, oh, we're having people over, should we have ham? And people, someone will say, no, you do that on Easter, right? Because it's an Easter thing, special things for Easter. My Growing up, my one aunt always had an Easter bunny kind of shaped cake on the table. You do special things for Easter because Easter is important. It matters. But why? Even in the church, when we talk about why we follow God and how we follow God, we tell people about how you can do that. We usually talk about the Good Friday stuff and not really the Easter stuff, right? I, I, I mean, here it is. Uh, the good news of Jesus is this. We have all sinned, every single one of us. We have all rebelled against God. We have disobeyed God. That sin and that sin separates us uh, from God for all eternity. And there's nothing we can do to get rid of it. And because it keeps us from getting to God, the default destiny of all people is an eternity separated from God and his good. That's hell. That's the default destiny for everybody. But because God loves us, he sent his son Jesus to this earth to live the perfect life that we couldn't live. We certainly haven't lived. And to give up that perfect life to pay for our imperfect lives, to pay the penalty for our sins, to purchase us back from our sins. So that anybody who accepts this gift from Jesus, anybody who leaves their old ways and follows him instead, is set free from the death of sin and welcomed into new life, eternal life, with God in heaven. Jesus did that by suffering and dying on the cross on what we call Good Friday. That's the basics of the gospel, everybody, but it's all Good Friday stuff. It's not Easter stuff. And giving the basics of the gospel, we rarely mention resurrection of Jesus from the dead on that first Easter. So what about this Easter stuff? Why then is Easter so important? Because it is important. I mean, the resurrection of Jesus, Easter, it's not just tagged on there so we have a happy ending to what otherwise would have been a miserable conclusion to Jesus' story. It's not like, oh, we've got to have a happy ending, so yeah, and then, um, oh, Jesus rose from the dead again. No. It's actually very important to our understanding of how and why we follow Jesus for the gift of new life that he offers. And we get a glimpse of that importance in our scripture passage today out of Matthew 28. So let's look at it. It's a familiar story to, to most of us, right? Many of us, we look at it every Easter. It's early, just before sunrise, dawn, Matthew tells us. On the third day since Jesus' crucifixion, so Friday he's crucified, Saturday and Sunday, so it's the third day. And we're told some women who were his friends, they were his followers, he was important to them. They're going to visit the tomb of Jesus now finally because the Sabbath is over. Sabbath would have been Saturday where they didn't work, they didn't go anywhere. So now that it's Sunday, they can go visit the tomb. And Matthew tells us that it's Mary Magdalene and another woman named Mary, but not the Mary who is the mother of Jesus. We talked about this in Sunday school today. It was the Mary who was the mother of one of the like 1,700 Jameses we read about in the New Testament. We're not exactly sure which one, but it's that Mary. According to Mark and Luke, there, there are a couple other women who are part of the party too, Joanna and Salome, who we really don't know anything about. So there's this group of women. And at this time, there is an earthquake. Matthew connects this earthquake to something spectacular, spectacular happening at the site of Jesus' tomb. He says, an angel of the Lord comes down from heaven and just rolls back the stone from the entrance of the tomb. And most of us know Jesus was buried as many in that place would have been in those days. His body was laid in a shallow tomb. And then a large stone was placed or rolled in front of the entrance for a couple of reasons, really. One was to discourage grave robbers. 
The second was, it was just practical. It kept the stench in that cave from getting out to where everybody could sell the stench of a decaying body. But we also know from Matthew's gospel that a special seal had been put on, across the stone at the tomb of Jesus by the Romans who had secured it away from Jesus' followers because some of the authorities thought they might come and try to steal the body and make up a story or something. I don't know. So they seal it. But this sealed stone, it's no problem for the angel. He, he just kind of appears, just kind of eh, shoves it aside. Uh, do you ever, lift a, you ever try to move a big, heavy stone? You're like, oh, and it's, you know, the game will just kind of, eh, here it is. You know, we'll just move it out of the way. And, and the way Matthew reads, it almost seems as if moving this stone, it was such a momentous event in the history of all the world that it caused the whole earth to shake, and that was the earthquake. But really, it could have just be that by God's design to add some flair to the whole thing. The earthquake would just happen to coincide with the moving of this stone. Now, there are some Roman soldiers at the tomb. They had been stationed there to guard against any funny business. But this is beyond any funny business anyone could have ever pred predicted or thought would happen. So when the soldiers witness all this, they are terrified. They are so terrified that they pass out. They're like dead men, Matthew says. They pass out. You ever been so t terrified that you passed out? It happens. Take a look at this. Watch the guy on the right. It happens, right? When you were just so frightened, you pass out. The appearance of the angel was that terrifying to the soldiers. They just pass out. And then the angel, having opened the tomb, just kind of stays there in his glowing glory. He's just kind of hanging out there. And we don't know... Uh, if the earthquake and the moon stone happened before the women got there or as they were getting there or after they got there. Uh, we don't know exactly the sequence of that, but either way, the result is the same. The women are now able to stare into an unexpectedly empty tomb. It's a terrifying moment for the women, uh, perhaps more terrifying for them than it was even for the Roman soldiers who have now passed out because they're so afraid. See, on top of this horrifying sight uh, of this angel in all its glory there, the tomb where their friend's dead body was supposed to be is open and exposed, and the body's not there. I, I mean, imagine, you're visiting a cemetery, right? You're, go you're going to stop by uh, the burial site of, of a friend or family member, someone you've loved who's meant something to you, and you know where it is because you've been there before, and you get there, and there is the, the, the tombstone there, but in front of the tombstone, uh, there's this big old hole in the ground, and it's empty. And that's freak. I'm freaked out. I'm getting out of there. Like, what's going on here, right? So it's scary in itself, but in, in this case, in the scripture, then look again <laughs> at the freaky, terrifying angel who is there. It's terrifying. And that's why the angel opens up his words to the women by saying, do not be afraid. You know, we mentioned it in Sunday school this morning, those of you who were there. It's like the angels always say that, right? The angel has some very important information to pass on to these women, and he knows they will hear nothing he's telling them if he doesn't first calm them down. So he tells them, do not be afraid. I don't know about you, but I don't think that would have been enough to really calm me down. But it seems to do the trick well enough for the angel to continue his message. And here's the message of the angel to the women. You're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He is risen. Come see for yourself. And that's why the stone had been rolled away. The angel didn't roll the stone away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away so the women could come and see as the angel tells them, hey, the tomb is empty. And then the angel continues his message. Go tell his disciples. He's going ahead of them in the Galilee. They're going to see him there. That's the message. So Matthew tells us the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. They're going to tell the disciples, what's their message? 
It's not just that Jesus has risen. The whole message is from the words to the mouth of the angel, he has risen just as he said. That was the message from the angel that the women, as the first evangelists of the good news, they took to his disciples. He has risen just as he said. Now he has risen. That's the headline. That's the news. But as I, I highlighted on the slide there, just as he said is so crucial because it explains one of the reasons Easter is in fact important. Easter, the resurrection, is important because it is just as Jesus said. Because Jesus had said ahead of time that he would be killed and then he would rise again on the third day. He wasn't just making it up as he went along. You know, kids do that sometimes. They make things up as they go along. You ever play with kids with their toys? I was playing with a little girl with her toys not too long ago, and she had a Minnie Mouse and a Han Solo from Star Wars. Right? So naturally, they're going on a date together, because that's, that's where role play always goes with little girls, right? But, but they don't get too far, because then the T-Rex from Jurassic Park shows up to eat them. But it's not really a problem, because then Barbie's there, and he just kicks the dinosaur over, and, and then subdues him so that Barbie can then ride the T-Rex as her transport to take, to take Minnie and Han Solo on their date. And of course, now Barbie's got a date, too. Tommy, the Green Ranger from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, is there. And, and, and you know, I'm just there trying to play along, but this doesn't make any sense. I mean, Come on, kid. These toys aren't even in the same scale. They're not from the same universes. So I just want to sit this little girl down and explain to her, it's quite obvious to me. You did not plan for me. You did not think through this ahead of time. You're just making it up as you go along because that's what kids do. It's not what Jesus did. He had told his disciples multiple times beforehand that this was going to happen. He was saying it in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He said it a second time in Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 22. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And we see him telling them a third time in Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 17, where it says, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will be condemned him to his death and, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. You know, he actually gets specific now about how he's going to die. But then he says, on the third day, he's going to be raised to life. It's me. That's what he tells them. Jesus' resurrection, his defeat of death was not a surprise. I mean, it was a surprise. But anyone who had actually been listening to Jesus, it shouldn't have been a surprise to them because it was just as Jesus said. Let me ask you, what would happen if you leave here today and you encounter someone you know, right? right? Someone you're going to spend Easter with. And they say to you well, this afternoon, I'm going to be shot and killed. But don't worry, because Tuesday morning I'm, I'm going to come back to life again. And so you'd be like, okay, whatever. And you just go through your day with them around. And then suddenly someone shows up and they are shot and killed in a shocking and terrible way. And that they actually die in your arms. And then as things progress, you watch as the coroner comes and carries out their dead body in a body bag. And so you spend the next day or two just in a daze. It's terrible, horrible. You're traumatized. Tuesday morning, there's a knock at your door. You go and you answer it. And there's your friend. There once more, they're alive and well. And they say, ha ha, see, it's me. I told you. And you know it's true. You know without a doubt they were dead. And now you know without a doubt they are now alive in front of you. What would you do? What would your response be to the, this person? Is there anything this person could tell you now that you wouldn't believe? There would be nothing. That's why Easter is important, one of the many reasons. Jesus' predictions about the manner of his death and then his resurrection three days later were the most heinous things he was out there saying. 
They were so outrageous that, that the people who heard him saying them, they just ignored it or they didn't get it. They thought, oh, he's speaking metaphorically about something we just don't understand. Or they just flat out didn't believe him. But then Easter morning, it was just as he said. Jesus defeated death just as he said. Three days later, he was risen just as he said. Here's the thing. If he kept his promise about that and did just as he said, you can be certain that every other promise Jesus had, has made to you will be just as he said. You can depend on, you can trust, you can have hope, and every promise Jesus has ever made to you because of Easter. What promises has Jesus made to you? Well, John chapter 11, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. By rising of his own power on Easter, Jesus proved that he is the resurrection and the life. For Jesus, there is now no death. There is just life eternal. And here he promises that all who believe in him will also gain this eternal life. Whoever finds life in Christ, a rebirth of the Spirit, now free of sin, will never die. You just live your life believing in Jesus and heaven awaits, eternal life awaits. Jesus said it. And because of Easter, we know it will be just as Jesus said. Another promise comes to Jesus in John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus here repeats again, he is life. And he clarifies that the only way to the Father in heaven, to God, is through the life he offers, through his life that he is giving you. There's no other way to God. There is no other way to heaven. I know the popular idea out there is the exact opposite, right? Lots of people think there are lots of different ways to heaven. Lots of people think they can do their own thing, they can live their own way, and they can just find their own way to heaven. <clears throat> that idea is out there, believe me. Take a look at this clip. Steve Harvey who many of you know as the host of Family Feud. Maybe you've even seen uh, short videos of him online talking about Jesus, and you think, oh, that's so nice. But wait. There's no one, one way to heaven, no one way to paradise. It's like television. Now it's over 800 channels of cable, and they're all pretty entertaining. So I'm pretty sure, man, that to get to heaven, there's got to be more than one route. And because somebody watching another channel or taking another channel than you, they still getting entertained and they probably still getting to heaven. That's heresy. That, that's the exact opposite that Jesus says here. Folks, Jesus said he is the only way to life. That's his promise. The only way to God, the only way to heaven. And because of Easter, we know it is just as he said. Here's another promise from Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Jesus promises to all who come to him, all who follow him in this new life, he says, you will find rest. I will give you rest. Rest from that compulsion, that need to sin. Rest from the strivings of this world. Rest from the need to measure up. Rest from the worry and the anxiety that flare up when things are just going horribly wrong. Rest from all the things that sin brings into our lives. Hate and anger and rage and lust and selfishness and jealousy and doubt and abandonment. He says, Jesus says, I, I, I can, I'll give you rest from it all. When you turn from yourself and follow me for new life, you will have rest. And because of Easter, we know it's true because of Easter, it will be just as Jesus said. You know, Jesus <clears throat> makes many other promises to us that are recorded in his word. And because of Easter, we know that they will be just as he said. Here's the thing, the final takeaway for us here today. Maybe you're going through something tough right now. Maybe it's something outward like, like a, a financial concern or a relationship 
problem or an issue at work or a sickness you or a loved one is facing or maybe it's an inward struggle, struggle with temptation, or a struggle to conquer an inward vice or an attitude you know is not glorifying to God, or a struggle to overcome doubt and fear. Or maybe the struggle is one of faith. Maybe you have never confessed to God what He already knows, that you're a sinner. Maybe you've never turned away from your sin. Maybe you've never made the decision to follow Jesus instead and to receive the forgiveness of sins that he offers you, the gift of eternal life. And through his word, through his church, through his Holy Spirit, through prayer, through other followers of Jesus, Jesus is speaking some of these promises of his into your life right now regarding whatever struggle you are facing. And maybe just like those people who heard his promises about his upcoming death and resurrection... You're just not hearing his promises. You're not paying attention to what Jesus is promising. You're not believing his promise. Whatever your struggle, Easter comes along to remind you that you can believe and put your trust in every promise Jesus has ever made to you. Every promise he's ever made to take care of you, here and now, and for all eternity, because on Easter morning, Jesus rose from the dead just as he said. And so you know that all of his other promises to you will be just as he said. That's why Easter is important. The hope in what Jesus has said. Let us pray. Dear God, we do thank you so much for, for Easter and just uh, this reminder to us that we can depend on the promises of Jesus. He promised he'd be back and he'd come uh, be risen to life, and he was. And so we thank you for the hope that gives us that we can hope in all his other promises. Because if he can keep that promise, he can keep them all, God, we know it. And so we thank you. We thank you that in him we have the promise of forgiven sins and life eternal, the life that, that uh, we witness him having on Easter morning, God. Let that be what drives our life. Let that be what gives us hope as we endure what we come across in this world, the hope of Easter. Pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.